way I sort of see this is that, you know, the turn of the 20th century, the biggest banks, and J.P. Morgan was uh, one of the prime examples, played an active role in the management of many of the nation's key industrial companies. Uh, J.P. Morgan uh, uh, partners, for example, sat uh, routinely on the boards of railroad companies, steel companies, other large corporations. Now, it began to change leading up to the Great Depression as reformers like Louis Brandeis warned again and again and again about the dangers of both conflicts of interests and the concentration of power. And as they generated greater and greater public support for the notion that these should be separated, after the 1929 crash, the Glass-Steagall Act clamped down on the bank's interconnectedness with industry by separating boring banking, uh, like checking and savings accounts, from the high-risk gambling found on Wall Street. So I'm glad we're having this hearing today because our banks and industrials have, have changed, but the dangers of concentration and the principles at stake have not. And that's why I share the concern of many of my colleagues about asset managers at huge Wall Street banks exercising control over key parts of America's infrastructure. So I thought I'd start my questions with you, Mr. Rosner. If we ever experience, again, a crisis like the crisis in 2008, how do you think Wall Street control over electric plants or seaports or airports could factor into the systemic risk confronted by the Department of Treasury and the Fed and ultimately the taxpayer. Right. As I, as I said in my, in my testimony, I think that those are, are very real risks that need to be considered. Um, the situation is not terribly different than in 2008, where we watched the industry um, go from originally making mortgage loans to taking over through investment banking the entire mortgage complex from front, hiring third-party mortgage originators, pooling packaging securities, making money on the sale and trading of those securities, proprietary trading on those securities, owning the servicing, and in some cases we watched the servicing companies that they purchased run not by separate divisions, but actually be owned and operated by the trading desk, creating significant opportunities for informational advantage of the firm over its customers, and incentives that, that frankly led to many of the, of the outcomes that we've saw, seen, and losses, okay? The, the problem ends up being that with the backstop of the Federal Reserve, with the backstop of insured deposit regimes through the FDIC, there will always be an ultimate call on the system. Now, one institution theoretically could be resolved under Dodd-Frank. I don't believe that Title I, Title II works. But even assuming that it could, the reality is if we had a catastrophic risk in one of these infrastructure businesses, the counterparty exposure would lead to exactly the same outcome, the calls for more, more, more collateral the risk of contagion, counterparties backing away, liquidity leaving the system, and ultimately the government being called in to stabilize the risk of, against the risk of contagion. Or, or to say this another way, the interconnectedness Absolutely. increases the likelihood Absolutely. that these institutions That's remain right. too big to That's fail. Right. And as I, as I said before, you know, one does have to question what would have happened if, in fact, the Exxon Valdez mm -hmm. was owned by one of these bank holding companies. Yeah, good, thank you. I have another question for you. You know, I don't think there's any question that institutional investors like pension funds hope that asset managers at a big bank will return solid profits over time. But I also don't think that most retirees realize that their pension or retirement savings are used to pave the way for big banks to be able to control an electric plant or an oil refinery. So, Mr. Rosner, what dangers do you think result from big banks spending, as Brandeis put it, other people's money to amass 
this kind of power and control. Well, I, I mean, I think we saw this with J.P. Morgan's ownership and control of U.S. Steel, one sixth of the nation's railroad uh, rail lines, um, General Electric, and, and Edison. Um, and we saw the, some of the outcomes, the consolidation of the power, the impact on pricing. I think it's also, though, important to, to really think about, and if you have any questions about the strategy here, look at some of the footnotes in, in my written testimony. The statements, the language used by these uh, asset managers, these bank-run asset managers, in pitching to those firms include the advantages of controlling monopolistic and quasi-monopolistic assets as an inflation hedge because of the ability to negotiate long-term leases with riders that allow pricing to rise even when demand falls. So uh, say this one again, Mr. Roger. I, mean, I just want to make sure you put the right summary on this. These people are out amassing this power. They're using the money that people invest, for example, in their pension plans. They're using it to amass this power, and then they're selling in effect, themselves on the notion that if you will invest with their company, they are going to have the benefits of having created this, this powerful and interconnected sort of uh, 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 corporate and banking conglomerate that will be able not only mm -hmm. to produce big returns because you figured out the right things to invest in, but produce big returns because they will have as you describe it, monopoly control. As they, as they describe as it. They, as you describe, they're describing correct. it. Correct. Because they will have monopoly. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Rosner. I think. Professor Omarova, uh, you've written about how regulators began chipping away at Glass-Steagall starting in the early 1980s and began breaking down the wall between commercial banking and investment banking. So I want to ask you the other part of the question. What do you think is the impact of a financial institution being able to take consumer deposits while also being able to control, say, an electric plant or oil refinery through its management division. Professor Elmarova? Um, that, is, that is a very important issue that you know, needs uh, actually further significant research. And I'm hoping that this hearing will start the process of asking the questions of the people who can provide us with information for us to be able to arrive at the full conclusion on that. But as a preliminary matter, right, as a person sort of applying common sense and some, uh, some knowledge of what's been happening in the past, right, I would say that there are some serious, uh, serious concerns with that situation. Uh, we've, we've talked today a lot about potential, for example, for manipulating prices in either market. Uh, now, it may or may not hurt the individual consumers, but that, that, that raises an issue of market integrity in the financial markets, also in the underlying commodities markets, right? Um, it also interferes with the traditional supply and demand dynamics that typically forms prices in a variety of markets. So do we want that to happen? Of course not. Is it happening? It's hard to tell. But might it happen? Of course, it can happen. And that's the issue to be asked. Then there is this whole um, another uh, problem with, you know, the systemic risk and uh, whatnot. We already talked about it. But then ultimately, you know, if you think about it from the point of view of regulatory per a regular person, it, 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 you know, if this trend were to continue uh, without any kind of principled limitation on what should be allowed to banks simply because they can afford to do it maybe cheaper than others, then probably at some point in the future we will find ourselves in a situation where we, uh, you know, not only do we buy our house uh, with the money borrowed from a big bank, uh, not only that house was built maybe by a subsidiary of that big bank, uh, it's heated and electrified and provided with water that is also uh, distributed and perhaps produced by that same bank, and who knows what else. In fact, you know, this is a, a hyperbolic hypothetical, of course. Uh, being a law professor, I can't resist that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, one could envision J.P. Morgan's new slogan is, you know, get everything you need from your friendly, local, global financial conglomerate. And perhaps that's okay. Perhaps that's the kind of a future for this country that we should be prepared uh, to live with because 
JetBlue or an oil refinery in Pennsylvania actually gets cheaper financing of its inventories, right? But if that's the case, what I'm asking for is a chance for a public deliberation. We have to be able to make that decision. Uh, Mr. Roster, did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, uh, only in the, in the discussion of cheaper financing. Because I think it needs to be, again, stressed. There is nothing wrong with vertical integration of industries. There's nothing wrong with investors owning those assets, investing in those assets, controlling those assets within the confines of regulation. When you have institutions that have access to the Fed window, and that may well be the basis of their cheaper financing. It's anti-competitive. It prevents Wall Street, and I'm talking about investors, I'm talking about where price discovery happens, where, where people buy and sell securities trying to bring price and value in line. You're distorting the ability of markets to function. And I think that really needs to be front in people's minds here. This is not about you know, liking or disliking Wall Street's investments in infrastructure assets. That's a clear driver of our economy. The question is tying those to competitive advantage of the federal funds. Well, it's both. It's competitive advantage and it's risk right. that we're talking about. No, that's in. right. So let me ask the question then in the, from the other direction. And that is that Senators McCain, Senator Cantwell, Senator King and I recently introduced a 21st century Glass-Steagall Act. So what impact do you think a new Glass-Steagall Act would have on the developments you've seen in the marketplace? Well, Rosner? so first of all, I have, I, have not read the, uh, I have not read the text, so I can't comment on this. Fair enough, but I'll tell you, it's short. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do worry that given the complexity of these institutions, it may be difficult to achieve, and if, even if we did have the congressional intent uh, to do so. Um, we've got institutions whose uh, derivative books themselves are enormous, uh, and frankly there are real questions as to what they know of their uh, thresholds within yeah. those businesses. And so I think to, to expect the quick dismantling of those would be difficult. Uh, fair enough, although I will tell you in the bill, there's a five-year period because it acknowledges exactly that point, that we have created a tangle and it takes time to undo that. But at least in terms of the direction we're trying to head, and that is to, to say that commercial banking, boring banking, should be separated from these other functions. Well, we certainly have seen, uh, seen negative outcomes for the broader economy and frankly for financial markets as a result of the combination of those businesses. Now, we often hear, uh, well, but our, our largest institutions will be less competitive globally, to which I, I would usually respond. One, we have, uh, first of all, I would be very happy if this gentleman was able to secure cheap funding because a German bank had a cheaper cost of funds because it had a backstop of the German government and I would actually find that to be okay if we outsource that risk, prevent our largest institutions yeah. from underpricing risk to be competitive. Because in Europe, through but, actions... Let me just make sure I'm following. You'd be glad to shift that risk over to the absolutely. German taxpayers right. so long as the American taxpayers that's a, don't Well, that's the point, right? So we have, in our country, Dodd-Frank, the intent was to make sure that our largest financial institutions are not sovereign obligations. In Europe, they have accepted them as sovereign obligations. And so that competitive issue really suggests that we are willing to say, let business get funding from capital markets, where, by the way, most of it comes from, or where foreign banks are willing to underprice risk because lending is very risky, as we discussed. Let them do so without creating the race to zero, bringing our institutions down that road. Okay, or to say it another way, but not the American taxpayer. That's right. And Professor Omarova, would you like to weigh in on that? Well, personally, I think that um, uh, the proposed bill on the 21st Glass-Steagall um, Act, um, 21st Century Glass-Steagall Act, is a move uh, potentially in the right direction. What I want to emphasize, though, is that 
just by separating boring banks from the rest of the financial system, we may not completely, of course, resolve the issue we're talking about today, because ultimately, this is about financial institutions that are also dealers and traders in financial markets, capital markets and credit markets, uh, being engaged uh, on such a large scale in the physical trading of commodities. That's the combination that uh, uh, worries us here today, and that doesn't necessarily depend on the actual charter. So uh, I would urge uh, you, Senator Warren, and your colleagues to uh, perhaps, y you know, think more, uh, um, you know, in terms of perhaps expanding the uh, the. Uh, I think the I think it's fair to say that many of us are uh, very well aware of the need for multiple tools in the toolbox, and looking for more ways to move us in the right direction. That Glass Steedle is not designed to solve every problem but it helps move us in the right direction, helps reduce risk, helps uh, uh, at least to some extent disentangle what has become a mess that is both hard to regulate and is creating additional risk on its own. So, Mr. Weiner, I read your testimony about what happened in the market for aluminum as a result of the activities of the large financial institutions. I thought it was pretty alarming. And I just wanted to ask you, can you describe specifically how you think the market developments here have affected consumers? <clears throat> we are the ultimate consumers here of aluminum, and it affects all of us. Um, what it does is it, if it, it, it takes away our opportunity to give the consumers what they want. Our consumers, in our particular case, 60% of our products are packaged in aluminum. Uh, we'd like to give them what they ask for. When they want aluminum, we give them uh, the punch top can, we give them the aluminum pint, we give them all these innovations, which creates jobs. We can buy new can lines to promote and, 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 and push our business forward. These are the things that are held back from us that we cannot offer to the, to the general public. Oops, thank you. That's, that's very useful. And Professor Omarova, uh, you wrote last year that big banks began actively seeking expanded authority to conduct physical commodities and uh, energy trading activities in the early 2000s, shortly after the fall of Enron, the pioneer in financializing commodity and energy markets. Now, you said in this paper that it's difficult to draw causal connections here because of the timing, but you also seem to have a hunch that this wasn't a coincidence. Would you be willing to expand on that a little? Well, again, let me reiterate, uh, I, you know, I, don't, I haven't done research to substantiate the link between the fall of Enron and the rise of Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs as this kind of integrated super intermediary derivatives slash physical commodities traders. Um, but, uh, you know, there is at least a plausible, a very plausible argument that Enron was the pioneer in discovering a business model that brought together uh, the ability to uh, move physical commodities like oil, gas and other things, right, through a network, vast network of commodity infrastructure throughout the entire nation and uh, a, a major derivatives platform that is tied to the price of those commodities mm -hmm. that Enron was moving. Now, it's important to understand that in that model, it's not really even the key to own any particular producing company in that chain or any particular distributor, right? Through contractual networks, Enron was able, or at least it was seeking the ability to establish this kind of vast uh, network of uh, kind of trade intermediation plus financial intermediation. Um, what happened to Enron, we all know. Now, um, once that model, though, was discovered, uh, that model was up for the taking. And um, I think that the early 2000s uh, is uh, a particularly important threshold uh, because that was the beginning of the major unprecedented global commodities boom. And um, again, it is hard to draw any kind of causal connections. Was the boom, at least in part, uh, facilitated by the influx of the financial institutions into the commodities market and financialization of commodities markets, 
Perhaps, at least partly, the answer is yes. Or was it the other way around? Was it that when Citigroup, for example, and JP Morgan saw that uh, uh, physical commodities have become the next hot asset class after uh, the dot-com uh, dot uh, boom ended, uh, they've decided that they should use this sort of uh, ability in the statute to actually start getting into that physical commodities game? I'm sure partly, uh, at least, the answer is yes. So I, I do have to say here, whichever way the causation arrow runs, the notion of that two of our largest financial institutions in this country are adopting a business model that was pioneered by Enron suggests that this movie does not end well and that uh, we are now pulling more and more risk into the system and that what happened with Enron is at least should stand as a cautionary tale as we look forward uh, to the integration of these larger financial institutions and the commodities market. So thank you very much. 